Great. Thanks, everyone, for coming to my talk. Um, I am Stefan Lemmer. I'm advised by Professor Jason Corso, co advised by Professor Kira Barton. And I'm going to be talking today about hazy oracles in deep learning. So, an offsite motivation for robotics research is the rapidly aging population. And this is with good reason. About 10,000 people turn 65 every day. And of those people, about 80% of adults above the age of 50 expect or hope to be able to age in place in their homes. If we combine this with the fact that about 70% of these aging individuals are going to need long-term or um, long-term services, there are some works that predict a tremendous shortfall in the number of caregivers. That is 151,000 caregivers in 2030 and 355,000 caregivers by 2040 in the United States. And one particular method for mitigating this is, of course, using human support robots that kind of handle those day-to-day -day tasks. So what do elderly individuals want from these human support robots? Uh, one work evaluates the attitudes that people have towards a number of assistive tasks, and the specific attitudes do vary from task to task. But the report showed that humans preferred tasks classified as fetching or organizing to be performed by a robot. Uh, such tasks include things such as reaching for objects, picking up or moving heavy objects, finding or delivering items, and fetching objects. So in practice, one of these fetching object tasks is going to look like this. Uh, we'll say our underlying task here is to for the robot to retrieve the orange mug and bring it to the individual making the request. The human is going to provide a request, such as please fetch the orange mug, this reflects the task, and then the robot is going to execute, take the mug and bring it back to the human. And there are obviously a lot of underlying tasks involved in this and a lot of underlying problems. There's path planning, obstacle avoidance, text to speech. But this talk is going to focus on the perception component of this. And the goal of the perception component in this case is to do, well, to do one basic thing. It's to look at an image, accept a natural language expression, and then identify the target object. And in the literature, this is referred to as the application of referring expression competition. And it's a reasonably well-explored problem. Uh, for example, if we look at this image, which is similar to our motivating example, we're trying to fetch one of these two mugs, we have uh, deep neural networks that are able to take an expression such as right yellow mug, pass it through our task model, and then identify the target object, which is, again, the mug on the right box in blue. Similarly, if we take the same model and give it the phrase left coffee mug, we'll identify the mug on the left. So obviously, this, this is an example I showed specifically for this slide. Uh, but if we do analysis on aggregate, these methods are pretty strong. So uh, our experiments found that the task model we were using was able to achieve 91% accuracy. But critically, it had to operate under the assumption that human provided information is uh, flawless and unambiguous, so semantically correct and unambiguous, and that all such provided information is going to be equal to use. And we refer to this as the Oracle assumption. And it does have meaningful consequences in practice. So we had the example where we said that the human was going to say, please fetch the orange mug. And the robot was able to perform the task successfully. But what if instead the human had said, please fetch my mug? In this case, it's pretty straightforward to see that the robot would not be able to identify any of these potential targets by greater than 33%. So you know, you're just guessing at random. Uh, and in, because of this, the robot is forced to make a guess based on some opaque prior in the training data, resulting in perhaps it's framing the green mug. And the Oracle assumption is really a byproduct of the fundamental formulation of modern supervised deep learning. Uh, in order to make the task trackable, both from the perspective of training and evaluation, we have to have this structure, right? We have an input, a task model, an output, and a loss. So for example, if we get this image and the expression second hydrant, is passed through our task model to identify this target here, the second hydrant from the front. And this, uh, this target, this output can be classified as correct. And then that information can be, can be back propagated back into the task model to update the parameters and help make future answers that are similar better. Uh, similarly, if we were to have an incorrect inference, so if it were to ask left banana and identify the, uh, the bear there, it would draw an X, back propagate that information, and say, this is incorrect, let's try better, or use better parameters next time. Uh, not only does this make for straightforward training and perhaps the only tractable training regime, but it's also really straightforward for evaluation. If you look at these two examples, we can say, okay, I got one right, one wrong, 
50% accuracy, that's better or worse than a different model that gets 40 or 60%. And this is really good for a lot of the regimes, a lot of the challenges, a lot of the kind of fixed data sets we work with. But it does raise the fundamental question, and that is, is it better to be able to understand the utterance left banana when applied to this image, or is it better for the human and the AI together to be able to identify the target object and um, work together to identify the target object? And refer to this as a hazy oracle assumption. So in contrast to the oracle assumption, the hazy oracle assumption states that the human provided information may be incorrect, ambiguous, or misaligned with the features learned by the model. And since we've relaxed the oracle assumption into the hazy oracle assumption, we acknowledge that human input can be imperfect or outside of the model's understanding. So given this expression, please fetch my mug, which we covered previously was ambiguous, we can say, okay, the probabilities are equal across these three uh, these items. Ask the follow-up question, I don't understand, can you please rephrase? And this particular follow-up question is interesting because it um, allows us to maintain the supervised learning framework under the hood. Uh, the human can then provide a separate uh, request, such as get the orange one, that can be successfully processed, resulting in the robot fetching the correct mug, despite both of these items being inherently semantically ambiguous. And we're not the first to consider humans to be imperfect, uh, naturally, but previous work is generally focused on the input space. So in these works, we have things like work in the crowdsourcing domain that is able to aggregate inputs across multiple different tools that have different biases, or techniques such as flagging or removing and revising labels for which crowd workers disagree. And this is good for producing high quality input data, naturally, but it is suboptimal in the use case we've described for two reasons. The first is that if we use multiple human inputs for every individual uh, utterance, we created a system that is really not that useful, right? We have people who are forced to repeat every request several times. And second, if the issue is related to a single user's perception or the way they view the world, it's quite likely that more inputs won't actually help us achieve a better answer. For some cases, such as visual questions, Work has gone into detecting whether or not the human provided information fits some a priori categorization of high quality or low quality. So you see cases such as ambig ambiguity, uh, there's subjectivity, there's object or classifications such as false premises, which is the work on the right. Um, and although these questions are ultimately unanswerable, it's not really the only consideration or even the most important consideration when we're talking about trying to provide human inputs to deep learning models because the model by its training data has built its own understanding of the world. And this understanding of the world may not necessarily align with what the human understanding of the world is. For example, consider the case shown in the previous slide. There's not really a good definition or a definition by which a human would consider this uh, expression left banana to be ambiguous for this image, but the model is going to get it wrong regardless. Uh, however, if we treat the human and the AI as a team and request a new utterance, such as banana in front, uh, it's able to correctly identify the target object and say, okay, this is the right object. And this is not really just something that occurs sometimes. Uh, what we found is that on the RefCoco data set, which is the data set on which we've evaluated, even though the data was collected in such a way that it assumes the data is unambiguous, that all objects to be identified, just using the correct object or the best utterance in the data set, reduces error by over 76% over random. And random is the first input, so you're just saying the first thing that comes to your mind. And the pursuit of this value by deferred inference forms the basis of our work. So in order to, to achieve this, we need to accomplish three goals. First, we need to determine when to defer. And this must not only consider whether the answer is correct, but also whether the answer can be corrected by a new human input and additionally, what the cost of acquiring that new human input would be. And since these objectives are different from previous works, we must additionally produce novel methods for evaluating the success of deferred inputs. Last, we need to be able to take these multiple human inputs and aggregate them across deferral responses. And our work center across these three goals, that is determining when to defer, determining how to aggregate multiple, uh, multiple human inputs, and evaluating the success of a deferral method. Uh, we focus on the most recent three of these works that address these areas, starting with the evaluation of an ideal deferral function. So building an ideal uh, deferral function addresses this first part of the interaction. 
That is, given the expression, please fetch my mug, can you understand it or can you understand what you don't understand and request a uh, new human input or rephrase it? For this, uh, on the evaluation side, we introduced the notions of additional error coverage, mean additional error, and area under the mean additional error coverage curve or AMA. Uh, with respect to specific methods for deferral, we introduced dual loss additional error regression or DARE. And we're going to start here by discussing the evaluation we proposed. Evaluating deferral functions first, of course, requires us to define what an ideal deferral function does. And an ideal deferral function is going to defer inference and request new human information first when the answer is going to be incorrect or the answer is going to be high error, and when this high error answer can be improved by a new human input. We measure this using the novel notion of additional error which directly maps to these two requirements. Uh, in these formulas, Y represents the target output, so the, um, what we're trying to compare to. Y hat represents an estimate from our task model, so uh, in our work, it's the output of a deep neural network, where we apply the subscript C for a candid human input of unknown quality, and the subscript GS for the gold standard human input, and this gold standard human input is going to be available uh, during training and evaluation, but obviously not during deployment. Uh, so if L, L Y hat C Y is high, it means that the answer is incorrect. If L Y hat G F Y is low, it means the answer can be improved by a new human input. Uh, again, mapping directly to these two requirements. Um, and then we additionally have this uh, max term that reinforces the idea that the answer can be improved by a new or by providing the gold standard human input. The metric of additional error only provides performance on one task. That is, given one inference, is it correct? And can a new human input provide, um, provide a correction? And this is similar to work in classification, where you just get your classification output and say, this is correct or this is incorrect. And like these works, we need to be able to provide a, uh, an aggregate measure to determine whether or not the method works better than other proposed methods. So the first thing to note when we're doing this is we need to, instead of providing a correct or incorrect classification, so an answer for every example, the deferral function is going to provide a binary decision on whether to infer or defer. Given this, our goal is to minimize the additional error across the inferred uh, set of samples. To do this, uh, we have to evaluate across two axes. So the first axis is the coverage, which is the proportion of human inputs that are not deferred. And the second axis is the uh, mean additional error, which uh, as defined is the mean of additional errors across the accepted set, as is implied by the name. So this point here, this blue point, uh, every coverage is going to have a corresponding mean additional error. And that particular coverage or that target mean additional error is probably going to be an application specific criteria. But since our goal is not to execute on a specific application, our goal is to evaluate the values of a deferral function or the success of the deferral function uh, we take the mean additional error every coverage, calculate the area under that, and refer to it as the area under the mean additional error coverage curve, or the area under the main coverage curve, which is, since the vertical, vertical axis is error, the lower the better for the, both the may and the AMA. Our motivated application, the uh, robotic instance we discussed, is uh, doesn't have a gold standard human input to compare to, right? Because the language space is very large. Uh, so what we needed to do for this particular evaluation is we needed to look at tasks or applications that have a very straightforward notion of what a gold standard human input is. Uh, by doing this, we can compare, to, compare the candidate human input to the gold standard. The first of these applications is hierarchical scene classification. So in hierarchical scene classification, we have a image as the fixed input, and this image fits into one of 397 scene classes. And as our hazy human input, we have a coarse scene category, uh, such as indoor, outdoor, natural, or outdoor man-made. And there are seven of these coarse scene categories. Uh, as our output, there is one of those 397 fine-grained classifications, uh, for example, restaurant or ballroom. Uh, and then the error function is just whether or not the classification is correct. The other application we consider is called key point condition viewpoint estimation. In key point condition viewpoint estimation, we have a vehicle crop as our fixed input, as our uh, sensor reading, 
and a semantic key point click as our KZ human input. So for example, in this case, the semantic key point click corresponding to the back left wheel is given by this yellow star uh, in the center. Uh, the model then produces an estimate of the viewpoint in terms of azimuth, elevation, and tilt, and the success is measured by the geodesic error. And because these two applications have a meaningful notion of a gold standard uh, human input, we can attempt to measure and minimize the additional error directly. And to do this, we introduce the method of dual loss additional error regression. Uh, the fundamental underlying philosophy of there is to uh, regress this additional error directly in two separate parts, separating the probability that the human is correct, P human correct given here, from the expected additional error given that the human is not correct. The candidate inputs at inference time or at training time are generated randomly. The probability that the human correct is correct is trained for every sample. And the expected additional error given that the human is not correct is trained only when the candidate human input is not correct, which is how we enforce this conditional during training. At inference time then, given these two outputs, we can predict the additional error or the expected value of the additional error based on these two outputs, where we infer if the additional error is predicted to be low and defer if it's predicted to be high. Uh, you'll note there's no term for when the human is correct in this equation, and that's simply because in the condition where the human input is correct, additional error is zero by definition. Broadly, there are two alternative approaches to implementing a deferral function that we're going to use as baselines. The first of these two is evaluating the quality of the human input directly. We discussed this in a previous slide, and we're going to approximate some of these methods in a deep neural network setting by using coarse softmax response and entropy for the hierarchical scene classification task. Uh, this measures the confidence of the human input or is meant to approximate the confidence of the human input. And then for the key point condition viewpoint estimation application, we use the distance between the gold standard and the candidate key point in Euclidean space. Other approaches that are relevant to this problem evaluate the confidence of the model output. That is, do we think the model is correct in its inference? And this field is called selective prediction. And though it often relies on very unique training procedures and very task specific approaches, uh, we focus on more straightforward baselines that can be applied to the already existing task models. Uh, for this, we use the softbacks response, which was shown to work pretty well for um, classification tasks. And then output entropy, which is simply the information theoretic measure of entropy on the output distributions. For the key point uh, condition viewpoint application, we additionally introduce the baseline of percentile sampling. In percentile sampling, we take the distance between the mode, which is the output value the guess the model makes, and the nth percentile. And this is just because these percentiles or these outputs tend to be multimodal. Uh, that tends to be the nature of the ambiguity in this particular problem. Stefan, can you talk a little bit more about how you generate the candidate human input randomly during training? Yeah. Do you understand how that's reasonable for categorical scenarios like the figure? Yeah. But for like key point condition viewpoint estimation, that's a sort of a continuous field. So I mean, it's quasi continuous, right? It's, uh, I don't remember the exact dimensionality of the inputs, but I think it's 227 by 227 in that image space. So it is still possible to generate these inputs randomly. Uh, the probability that you select the gold standard key point is very low. Uh, but in this case, we actually redefined the gold standard key point to include uh, anything that has the same error as the gold standard key point. And we found out pretty well. So, so in that case, you would uniformly randomly sample? Yes. Yep. So does DARE outperform the methods inspired by the other approaches? Uh, first, we look at the application of key point condition viewpoint estimation. And we see in this case, there's some variance between the folds, right? There's no single best performer but there it does perform best on the mean. Uh, interestingly, if we look at the performance across the various folds a little bit closer, we see that the highest AMA for DARE is lower than the highest AMA for any of the other baselines. And the lowest AMA for DARE is actually the lowest, um, lowest one compared to the other baselines as well. And the reason for this, particularly the fact that the highest is lower than the other baselines is that some of these baselines um, line up better basically with the particular failure modes of the fold. So perhaps there are samples in one fold that are more likely to fail due to a high uh, Euclidean error. And this indicates that DARE has the ability or is more consistent because it has the ability to uh, simultaneously consider both the input and the output quality resulting in lower variance. 
For the application of higher scene classification, the data set is larger, so we simply maintain uh, train valent test splits, and we see that it does perform significantly better uh, on the AMA. If we evaluate specific uh, the mean additional area specific coverages, we see that there does perform best at most values. Uh, specifically, it performs best beyond a deferral rate of 80.3% or a coverage of 0.197. Uh, which means that if you are going to defer fewer than 80% of your samples, you're going to want to use DARE. Uh, at this point, the mean additional error is 4.5 times 10 to the negative 3, and that value corresponds to one out of every 222 of your examples being incorrect due to an incorrect input. If we try to uh, target specific mean additional errors, as I kind of mentioned a few slides back, uh, corresponding to horizontal lines on this chart, uh, we do see that using DARE gives us a reduction in deferral rate by up to 22.8%, um, by up to 22.8%. So we've shown numerically that DARE does outperform selective prediction-based methods as well as input-based methods uh, using the AMA metric, but numbers don't always do a great job of helping us build intuition as to what's going on. So I'm going to show here some examples, some visualizations based on the key point condition viewpoint estimation application. Uh, just to explain this image really quickly, the base image that is given to the task model is shown kind of underneath a heat map. Uh, on this heat map, the green represents a low air area, the red represents a high air area, and potential key point clicks that we want to highlight are shown just drawn as circles with the gold standard being shown in green. Uh, what we see in this particular image is a particular is a counterintuitive behavior with respect to the input, right? If you're trying to detect the potential failure modes simply based on the uh, distance between the gold standard and the um, the candidate key point, you see that the red key point is 30 pixels away, but induces a very significant additional error due to the uh, decision boundary created by this neural network on this image. Whereas the yellow key point way down in the bottom right corner is six times further away, but returns the same answer. And there are actually simpler explanations I can show you where it's not actually going to be any benefit to defer in this particular case, regardless of the Euclidean distance here, just because the model builds a very strong prior based on the image as to whether or not, or as to its output. So, the alternate approach that we discussed, as far as baselines are concerned, are the approach where we try to uh, where we try to figure out whether or not the answer is correct. So we see a very similar failure mode here, where the error is high everywhere in the image. So a selective prediction method that is asked to uh, get rid of examples that are probably incorrect is just going to defer no matter where the click is, regardless of the fact that it's not actually going to benefit you because you're going to receive the same answer. And last, there are cases where the gold standard is not actually the best performing human input. So in this case, we see that the gold standard input is shown in green uh, in a high error region, a red region here, and the candidate input is shown in red in a low error region here. And if we have a method that is just trying to find the correct answer and it works perfectly, like it's a perfect baseline, if we ask a human, if we say that this answer is incorrect, give me more help or give me another piece of help, they're going to keep clicking on this green key point. So there's not really a benefit to being able to defer. And this uh, really highlights the fact that we must not only determine if the model's output is incorrect, but also if the model output is incorrect and it can be improved by a new human input. So this previous section demonstrated some important facts related to when best to defer. Uh, specifically, we've shown that it is not only necessary to defer when the answer is incorrect or when the human input is low quality, but it's important to direct detect incorrect outputs that can be corrected by a new human input. However, there is one important fact that is neglected by this evaluation, and that's the fact that if we actually do a deferral, deferral response is also going to be provided by a hazy human input, or provided as a hazy human input. So we can't really say that the problem is totally solved just because we've been able to identify low quality inferences. Instead, we introduce a general formulation, evaluation, and method, and this method improves performance by considering not only the initial human input, but also the deferral response. We formulate deferred inference as the interaction between three components that we see uh, that we're going to discuss or demonstrate based on our initial example of retrieving a copy. The first component is the task model. The task model takes in fixed data, which is 
uh, our robot visual field uh, and a human input. So the request, so the request, uh, please fetch the orange mug. It then produces a distribution across outputs, um, which is which mug do I think it is given this input. Throughout this work, uh, it's important to know that we treat the task model as a given. So we don't really innovate on any task models because we want to demonstrate that the formulation we use can be generalized and rapidly integrated with novel architectures in this very, very quickly moving space. The second component is the aggregation function. And the aggregation function accepts multiple outputs from the task model and combines them together to produce a more accurate estimate. This combined distribution is then given to the deferral function. And we discussed deferral functions in the last section, but it has the goal of deferring inferences that it thinks are incorrect and can be corrected, as well as being subject to a constraint that we refer to as the deferral depth constraint, which is the maximum number of times that an individual task can be deferred. So like the previous section, we need to have a way to evaluate this model. We're going to begin with the same evaluation provided in the previous section, um, where we had a trade-off between coverage, that is the human effort, and mean additional error, that is the error. But since we are integrating a deferral response in this case, we are able to uh, evaluate based only on the mean error. So actually have an answer for every particular output, uh, which is nice both from a conceptual standpoint, and it does allow us to report whether or not, uh, or it does allow us to report on tasks that have continuous input that can't be easily quantified. Additionally, since a deferred human input is replaced with another hazy human input, the coverage is an insufficient measure of effort because it's possible to defer more than once for every sample. So if we were to use this coverage metric, we could go from negative infinity to one. Uh, so for this reason, we switch to the deferral rate, which is simply the number of deferrals per task. And although, as I've mentioned, the deferral rate has no specific upper bound, uh, throughout this work, we're generally going to treat it from zero to one. Last, our evaluation introduces a deferral depth constraint, which I mentioned on the previous slide as a specific number or the number of deferrals that can occur per task. And this is a manually imposed constraint, and it's important to some of the aggregation functions, some of the approaches I'm going to discuss in a few slides. So our goal then is to defer and integrate human inputs in a way that best balances three factors. The error, which is an application specific performance measure, the deferral rate, which is the expected number of deferrals per task. And this is all subject to the deferral depth constraint, which is a manually imposed constraint on the number of times a single task can be deferred. If we plot all three of the, or if we take a deferral rate and a deferral depth constraint, every single combination of these two has a specific uh, error. And we can plot this error as a surface that will look something like this. Uh, as our overall aggregate evaluation metric then, we've posed the deferred error volume, which is simply the volume underneath the surface. If we were to, uh, oh, where we constrain the deferral rate from zero to one and the deferral depth from one to 10. Uh, if you wanna look at it in a more simple way, the deferred error volume corresponds to a normalized mean of all of the error values if we're operating under the assumption of a rectangular integration. So how does this compare to the evaluation of previous works? So the short answer to that is our evaluation is much more thorough when we're considering deferral and aggregation functions. Uh, previous work has uniformly reported change in errors in error at a single point, uh, subject to time or number of query constraints. Uh, in some cases, this evaluation assumes a single out, uh, a single point such as a deferral rate and deferral depth constraint set of one, which is usually for technical reasons. In other cases, there is conditional deferral, but this conditional deferral is set uh, a priori based on some quality of the task model uh, and then is subject to just the results of human experiment and results in a single point, uh, such as at this location, which is very challenging to provide meaningful comparison when you have multiple variables like this. The particular work uh, that we're presenting here focuses on being able to improve performance by a novel aggregation function. So in the example image here, we have the outputs from two different uh, forward passes of our deep neural network. Uh, we have the target object, the cylinder here shown in blue, and the output of the model shown as a percentage uh, numerically. Method we propose is an aggregation function that simply uses a product of outputs, which is equivalent to a belief update or an AND operation, depending on which particular space you like to think in. Uh, 
Uh, and this is motivated by two needs. The first need we have is that such a method needs to be able to converge quickly and achieve a high level of certainty. And second, we need to be able to optimally aggregate information from human inputs that may each be ambiguous or may each be outside of the features that have been learned by the model. Uh, you can see that illustrated here, where although neither of these outputs are correct, neither of them identify the target object with the highest probability, our method is able to combine them and achieve a very high level of certainty. Uh, we take we compare this to a number of baselines from other work. Uh, the first baseline we use is naive replacement. And in naive replacement, we simply always use the deferral response. And that's really similar to your conversational virtual assistant, the little button you have sitting on your desk that will say, I don't understand, and then shut off, uh, clear all of its memory, and just make you start again. Two other methods we consider is our ensemble mean and ensemble consensus. In this case, if we defer inference, we simply take the deferral depth constraints number of new queries and aggregate them either by taking the mean of their outputs or taking the mode of their outputs. And when we take the mode of the outputs, we combine or we take, we break ties randomly. The last baseline we consider is smart replacement, where we look at the deferral scores for each of these uh, outputs and simply take the one that we believe has the highest confidence. So it's worth noting here that none of these baselines are guaranteed to converge with more human inputs. So for example, we see here ensemble mean, uh, the certainty in our answer actually goes down, the entropy increases. So if we don't have our manually imposed deferral depth constraint, uh, as has been typically used in previous work, we will just keep deferring forever and acquiring new human inputs, which isn't really an optimal scenario. We evaluate this on two applications. The first application is referring expression comprehension, and the second is single target video object tracking. Uh, we've discussed referring expression comprehension throughout this talk, but I'm going to do a, a quick job of formalizing it here. So in this application, we have an image as a fixed input, an image containing several objects. The hazy human input is a natural language query, such as a uh, top right mug. The output is a bounding box indicating the identification of the target on the image. Our error metric as a standard in the literature is whether or not the intersection of a union is greater than 0 0.5. If it's greater than 0 0.5, it counts as correct. Is less than 0 0.5, it is considered incorrect. Our task model for this application is Uniter, which is a, a visual linguistic transformer architecture with some pre training. And the deferral function we use is simply the softmax entropy, where we additionally add Monte Carlo dropout for a little bit more resolution around that decision. The other evaluation we consider, or the other application we consider, is single target visual object tracking. In single target visual object tracking, the fixed input is a video. And the human provides an initializing bounding box uh, indicating an object such as this person on the first frame of the video. The goal of the task model then is to propagate this bounding box throughout uh, the remaining frames of the video. Uh, as our evaluation or as our error metric, we use one minus the mean intersection over union of all frames. And as our task model, we use the top tracker, which is another uh, deep neural network that is trained or that is trained to predict the weights of the tracking module itself. Uh, as a deferral function, we sample bounding boxes from the output distribution of this model and calculate the IO yield. In our results for these two applications, we see first that our proposed method does outperform our baselines across both the visual object tracking task and the referring expression comprehension task, um, all of our scenarios. We see also that even naive replacement, even our simplest method, is able to outperform the deferral free condition. That is, if we don't have deferred inference, um, it outperforms this error zero deferral free condition, as we can see from this row, uh, which also corresponds to accuracy. We have the error one here, which is the accuracy if we allow a deferral rate of one. And we see in that case that we can reduce error by up to 48.73% which is not quite as high as the 77% we can get if we're perfect, but I think it's still a really good uh, performance improvement for the amount of effort that it requires. If we examine the marginals with respect to these particular constraints, we can see what their roles are on both of the applications. So we're gonna begin in this top right corner with the role of the deferral depth constraint on the task or the application of single target visual object tracking. Uh, interestingly, we see that most of the or most of the approaches, aside from errors shown in purple, 
get significantly worse as we increase the deferral depth constraint on this particular application. And that, again, highlights why this is important to consider specifically or consider explicitly in most cases. The other thing that's worth considering is the performance of naive replacement here. So we can see that if we allow a deferral depth constraint of one, naive replacement becomes the worst. But as we introduce, uh, increase the deferral depth constraint, it becomes competitive with all of the other methods. In particular, it becomes competitive with smart replacement, which actually uh, contradicted a previous finding that smart replacement was going to outperform a naive replacement because the deferral depth constraint was explicitly set to one. And last, we note that for the referring expression comprehension application up here, or down here in the bottom left, uh, there is only one case it looks like ensemble mean where the deferral depth constraint of one actually returns the higher performance or highest performance, uh, even when uh, returns the highest performance, even though most works in this field tend to set this at one just kind of as what they do. So we can see here that most of them are best beyond a deferral depth constraint of three. If we examine the marginals with respect to the deferral rates, uh, there's not too much exciting here, really. It performs pretty much as we expect, right? A higher deferral rate means a lower error. And the method we proposed on both applications performs best at all deferral rates beyond an initial kind of warm-up period here where we don't have enough samples for there to be a difference. So through this fairly simple method, we produce significant error reduction on data set based evaluations. But it is important to note that humans are not data sets. So if we intend to enable human machine interaction with an individual, we need to evaluate the characteristics of these individuals to determine when and how to defer. And we call this human centered deferred inference. And we're going to discuss some of these nuances in this section of the talk. So what do we need to do to shift from this aggregate analysis on crowdsourced data to human centered deferred inference? The first thing we need to note is that in our motivating example, we had an individual interacting with a computational agent and not just using data sets that we were able to download off the internet. What needs to change here? The first thing we need to do is we need to acknowledge that crowdsourced data does not accurately model the sort of interactions people are going to have with a real world robot or a real world deep learned system. Because of this, we know there may be meaningful distributional shifts or meaningful problems when we attempt to build a human AI team in practice. Second, the aggregate analysis we performed in previous sections allows us to determine the best method overall. But as I've alluded to previously, the deferral function is in practice going to be a binary decision. It's going to be infer or defer. Do I ask for more information or do I just perform an action? Because of this, we need to be able to set deferral criteria that target an error or a deferral rate. So let's first talk about the data collection process for our data set for RefCoco we're going to maintain this application of referring expression comprehension through the remainder of this work. Data for this application was collected by a two-player game where one player described a target object, such as being given this image and asked to identify this man outlined in red, giving the, uh, uh, giving the sentence man in red shirt on a horse. The second player then tries to confirm that the input is valid by providing a click on the target object when presented with the same image and the given utterance. Workers were sourced from both social media and Amazon Mechanical Turk. And while this two-player game format achieves its goal of validating annotations, at least to some extent, it is flawed at a pretty basic level when you consider how humans behave. And that is that people who know they're conversing with humans instead of computers use different language than when they know, uh, use different language. So one study specifically found that in conversations with a chatbot, people use fewer and shorter words and more profanity and negative emotion words than when they converse with a human. And this is more than just a subtle thing that's gonna show up in research papers or if we do a really in-depth distribution distributional analysis. So I pulled two examples here of really obvious back-channel communication. You might see instances such as congratulations, I'm glad you got the last one, or chastisement, do you not know your directions where it appears that one individual switched their left and right. Um, Additionally, in addition to these kind of back channel communications, the objective itself is suboptimal. So we see in this case that the goal is to click on a specific location in the image, not to actually identify the target object, leading to cases such as this, where instead of saying woman in the left or woman wearing a brown shirt, you get the expression glasses. And this works well for the process that has been proposed. And one could argue that it's going to work well if we use the priors of the RefCoco data set because there's no glasses class, right? There's just people. Uh, 
Um, but a human asking a robot to retrieve, for example, a hot dog is going to ask for a hot dog. They're not going to ask for the second streak of ketchup from the top left. The last thing we need to note here is that the reward structure for this task is going to encourage guessing. Uh, so they are the mechanical turf workers or the crowd or mechanical turf workers are paid based on whether or not they're able to perform the task successfully. The uh, social media workers get points for that. So if you have something like uh, annotator one woman, annotator two her, an expression that is ambiguous, the annotator that is asked to identify the person is encouraged to take a guess to get paid or to get points or whatever they're striving for. And that's a data related challenge. The other challenge we are addressing in this section is the ability to set the fraud criteria. And that is determining when the AI agent should actually defer. We begin this by noting that the deferral function is in practice going to be a deferral score, which we represent as S, and we're going to compare that to a threshold T. If the deferral score um, exceeds this threshold S, or exceeds the threshold T, we defer, otherwise we infer. Our goal then is to appropriately set T to target our error or our deferral rate. So to target the deferral rate, we receive this equation. To target the error, we get this equation. If we constrain our deferral depth constraint to one, and we do that just kind of to simplify the equations, make them easier to write out. Uh, the equation for the expected value of the deferral rate is pretty straightforward. It's just whether or not this value is greater than uh, greater than a threshold multiplied by whether that or the probability of that value is going to occur. For error, it is uh, similarly straightforward, but we do need to add the uh, probability of error given a specific deferral score. We assume that there is a correlation between the error and the deferral score as well as break it into two particular comp or two components uh, on the left here. On your right, we have the component that occurs if the deferral or the def if the model chooses to infer after the initial query. And on your left, my right, we have the error prediction if the model chooses to defer and collect the second piece of human information. Um, and these can be separated because they're mutually exclusive conditions. These two equations allow us to evaluate or to determine what the question we need to ask to be able to set a deferral score bar. Now, the first of these is do deferral scores vary significantly between users? And this affects both when we're targeting a deferral rate and when we're targeting an error. The second thing we need to determine is whether or not users respond differently when inference is deferred. So crowdsourcing is usually performed as a series of microtasks, which enforces an independence constraint between S1 and S2 alongside enforcing an independent independence constraint on the specific user. And last, we have this probability of error given score term that we need to consider, um, which we ask whether the calibration is dependent on the user. To address these questions, we set up a human experiment where we have this interface. We ask users to interact with a model de modern deep learning system, the same Uniter system we evaluated on previously. Given this interface, they are asked to provide a text utterance in which the green object box in green is going to be cropped. When the text utterance is provided, the human can choose to infer, or the model can choose to infer or defer. If it chooses to infer, the uh, area that is removed is grayed out and the target object is left in full color. And the whether or not it's performed correctly or incorrectly is shown in the top right corner, as well as highlighting in green for a correct answer or red for an incorrect answer. If the model chooses to defer, we have a screen that is very similar to the initial screen, but it restates the query provided by the user and asks them to try again. So let's revisit our research request questions really quickly. We have, do deferral rates vary, deferral scores vary significantly between users? How do users respond when inference is deferred? And last, is the model calibration dependent on the user? We perform our experiment across 28 individuals uh, with normal or corrected to normal full color vision. Uh, we removed three of these individuals as being um, inattentive or malicious as they had error of greater than three standard deviations from the mean. Uh, the mean age of our participants was 25.2, technical competence was 5.76 out of seven, and experience with conversational virtual assistance was 4.16 out of two, or out of seven. We have four treatments to this experiment, uh, deferral rates of 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 
the deferral rate of 0, 0.0 was given to all users first in order for them to establish a, a mental model of the system without this kind of noise of randomly provided deferrals. Uh, the treatment length was 30 tasks for each one. And the deferrals were performed quasi-randomly according to this function uh, in order to make sure that every individual got the particular deferral rate we were looking for. So the first question we asked was whether deferral scores vary significantly between users. And the answer is yes. So a Cresco Wallace test revealed the effective deferral score was significant, uh, effective user on deferral score was significant. And if we compare each individual user pairwise, we find that 79 of the 300 potential user pairings result in a statistically significant difference. But interestingly, this isn't fully bound to whether or not the answer is uh, the user's error, whether or not the user is good at interacting with the model. We do find cases as shown here where we have users that have the same underlying error when they finish performing the task, that is 13% in pink, 23% in blue, but they do have statistically significant distributions based on manual EU test. And overall, uh, this fact that the probability of the score is dependent on the user and this probability of the score is present in both equations supports the idea that deferral criteria must be set on a per user basis instead of being set on data sets or characteristics of the model. The second question we have is how do users respond when inference is deferred? And the brief answer to this is that the deferral response is likely to be less compatible with the model than the initial query. That is, the model will re return a higher deferral score to a statistically significant degree on the deferral response when compared to the initial query. And although we could not establish statistical significance on accuracy effects, we did find that if the deferral response was taken alone out of context with the initial query, the error would increase for about 3.5% from 19.82 to 23.39. But if we use the aggregation function proposed in the previous section, we were able to uh, reduce the error to 17.37%. And this tells us that while from an engineering standpoint, we would really like to only have to characterize one distribution for every user, uh, we do need to characterize the probability of S1 and the probability of S2 separately. And although we have demonstrated that humans have different input distributions, they uh, interact with the model better or worse, this has an impact on setting the deferral criteria, but we need to determine whether or not the probability of error is a property solely of the model or whether the user is involved in that one too. So to determine this is the case, if this is the case, we measure the strength of the relationship between error and deferral score under the condition where the user is and isn't considered. To do this, we follow the process of permutation testing. This is going to begin by building a distribution of mutual information for all of the uh, users uh, regardless, taken together, sampled together without respect to the individual user. And you end up with a distribution that looks normal-ish like this. Uh, we built, we've drawn the uh, 95th percentile here. So this is our, um, the threshold that allows us to reject the null hypothesis for an individual user. And what we found is if we draw all of these individual users as pink lines here, and none of them exceed that, null, uh, that threshold that allows us to reject the null hypothesis. So based on the information we have here, we say that uh, we su it suggests that the individual does not need to be accounted for when we're doing this model calibration. So we can actually do this particular piece on a large crowdsource data set, which is uh, great because these calibrations tend to take a lot of data. To do. So we've shown through a series of hypothesis tests that setting user-specific deferral criteria should be better than setting it based on data sets or a priori but we haven't actually done that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna to compare to deferral criteria based on a single user, and that's gonna be 37 samples out of our uh, train or out of our data collected. We're gonna compare that with a large crowdsource data set. It comes to about 2,900 examples for every individual user and the combined information from multiple users in our experimental set. And that comes to about 1,650 samples per user. And we do, two, we do this with two different goals in mind. So the first goal is to minimize the absolute error. That is how far uh, are we from our target for each user? And this is done in a fairly straightforward way. We can just locate the threshold on our calibration set that produces this target value. The metric for this is then just the mean absolute error across users. The second condition we consider attempts to place an upper bound on the deferral rate. So 
In this case, we want to say that our threshold is set such that we do not uh, exceed a certain probability of being above, for example, the deferral rate of 0 0.1. And we set this probability uh, signified by delta in that equation using the at, at 0 0.05. Uh, our particular method was the one proposed by Geishman and LGE for the application of selective prediction. Uh, and we evaluate based on the number of violations. So first looking at experiment one, where the goal was to minimize the absolute error, uh, we find that based on our deferral rate, um, no particular method or no particular calibration set performs best. Uh, the light of the most likely this is due to uh, the small data set used for individual, remember it's 37 samples versus the uh, incorrect distributions for the rep cocoa and the multi-user uh, settings. However, if the goal is to set an upper bound, we do see when it is very important to focus on individual users. So if we set the deferral criteria based on these large data sets, the model is able to achieve a very high, or the deferral criteria has a very high confidence in an incorrect distribution. So it simply looks at it and says, okay, I can set it here because I have this many samples, but the underlying distribution is incorrect, so you end up with a lot of violations. In contrast, setting it based on an individual does have some violations, some cases where it exceeds the target deferral rate of uh, 0 .0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, or 0.3, but this is still less than our threshold of um, 5%, so fewer than 5% of our examples are violations. And with this finding, we have completed a straightforward formulation of deferred inference, which consists of a path model, an aggregation function, and evaluation methods to determine how those two are working. We've discussed and explored when we should defer inference, how to aggregate human inputs after inference has been deferred, and how to measure it. In doing so, we've learned four main, uh, main lessons. The first is that it's important to consider the human AI team holistically when attempting to determine the best deferral function or the best human inputs to defer. It's not adequate to simply attempt to locate bad inputs or incorrect outputs. Second, it's important to treat the deferral response as imperfect. So if we follow the previous approach, the naive replacement approach of accepting the deferral response without question, we both lose out on the benefit of complementary information that could be contained in multiple human utterances, as well as ignoring the fact that the deferral response actually tends to be of lower quality than the initial query. Third, deferral constraints must be set intentionally. Despite the fact that most works tend to set deferral constraints a priori based on technical constraints or arbitrary decisions, they do need to be considered because the deferral depth constraint being typically set at one is almost never best on our application of referring expression comprehension. And last, we need to focus on individuals, not simply focusing on crowdsourced data sets, because individuals not only have dis different distributions of input qualities, but they respond differently with initial requests and deferral responses. So what happens when we put deferred inference and these proposed methods into practice? I'm going to quickly identify two benefits and one potential ethical concern. The first benefit is, of course, a motivating argument. So supervised training is somewhat human unfriendly, but being able to implement a method such as deferred inference is going to be able to have significant impacts, uh, such as enabling human support robots or methods that are able to answer visual questions to assist the visually impaired. The next benefit we consider is the potential ability to use smaller task models to achieve the same performance in terms of accuracy. So there's two meaningful reasons why we want to use this. Uh, the first is the environmental concerns. Uh, if we're training and updating a deep learn model, we are using a lot of power. Uh, a lot of you have probably seen uh, news articles about ChatGPT, which is the GPT-3 architecture. And a work has estimated that this model requires about 704,000 vehicle kilometers to train. So it's equivalent to driving a car of 704,000 kilometers, which is a lot, right? Uh, and if we can make do with smaller, more task-specific models, there's likely to be a meaningful benefit. Um, additionally, if we consider models of this size, we have to consider the fact that they can't be run on edge devices. Your cell phone can't run GPU-3. So what we need to be able to do, or what we need to do in practice, is we need to transmit these to uh, Google servers or OpenAI servers, uh, which has both problems when we're considering low connectivity conditions, as well as privacy concerns, because in a lot of the applications, they're going to be in your home, and you don't really want that information transmitted far. And while these benefits are definitely meaningful, it's important to consider that deferred inference is not actually going to solve some of the underlying problems with big neural networks. 
uh, particularly how they relate to learning uh, culturally insensitive features. And addressing this limitation of the decision boundaries produced by deep neural networks is really important, but it's a very active area of research outside of your own, outside of our own. And for this reason, we're going to highlight future work that's directly related to deferred inputs. Uh, the first of these potential areas that I would, would like to highlight is revisiting deferral functions. So the first section of this talk introduced DARE, which was able to explicitly separate cases where uh, the input or the inference can be corrected by a new human input from cases where it couldn't. But in some of the later tasks, we have to revert back to information theoretic kind of selective prediction type methods, because there's no good definition of a gold standard human input with which to which we can compare. Um, so in cases such as the visual linguistic problems, we can look at visual question answering, where there are two particular failure modes that might be considered that we have to treat individually. In this case, we have what's on the bed, which is an ambiguous question. If we ask the human to provide another question that is similar or addresses the same underlying task, that will work. But it's not the only failure mode, because in this particular scenario, the questions are being asked by individuals with uh, visual impairments and cell phone cameras aren't that great to begin with. So we end up with cases like this where the image is low quality. And being able to separate these particular failure modes and take the appropriate action accordingly is going to be uh, critical as we move forward and develop these methods. And although these kind of supervised taxonomies are an interesting starting point, are an important starting point, they also don't address the particular case discussed way back at the beginning of the talk where the input isn't incorrect, it just kind of mismatches with the features learned by our deep model. Other future work we'd like to look at is being able to perform additional user studies. Specifically, we want to look at uh, longer term real world studies in our proposed applications instead of this kind of uh, sandbox application of image cropping. And there are a few reasons we want to do this. The first reason is we want to be able to switch from random deferral with some post hoc analysis to meaningfully set user specific deferral criteria. And in doing this, we're hoping to not only um, figure out how well our deferral criteria work, but to be able to show greater and statistically significant improvements in accuracy. Second, we would like to shift from solely targeting a deferral rate to targeting an error. And we couldn't do this in the previous experiments because of, again, the size of our uh, individual experiments. It didn't allow us to characterize the distribution of deferral responses, and it really did not allow us to access statistical values in these very noisy uh, calibration of deep learning models. And last, we would like to see if there are more long-term trends in how these humans, or how these models interact with these humans, or these humans interact with these models, particularly when meaningful deferral criteria are imposed. Um, altogether, these findings are going to help us further characterize and optimize the interaction between humans who provide information that may be ambiguous, and deep learning models that expect information to be perfect and have notably opaque decision matters. This will lead to more usable human AI teams. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Uh, I'd like to briefly thank the people who have helped me throughout this uh, very long process, my committee, um, my lab mates, my family and friends who have kept me sane for the past few years. And I will happily now take any questions. <laughs>